Welcome to the Ad Watchers, a podcast brought to you by the National Advertising Division of BBB National Programs. We're a team of attorneys with 50 years of experience investigating and resolving disputes over the truthfulness and accuracy of national advertising campaigns. I'm Hal Hodis. And I'm Latoya Sutton. To make sure advertisers can back up what they're telling consumers, we don't just take ads at face value. We put them to the test. Why? Because advertising law is simple. It's the execution that's hard. Welcome back to another episode of Ad Watchers, NAD's podcast that gives a view into how the National Advertising Division reviews claims and applies advertising law. If this is your first time listening to us, no worries. Uh, you can just go on listening without worrying about having missed our first two episodes, but you should go check them out later. They're available wherever you are listening to this. Uh, so hi, Latoya. Hi, Hal. I guess I'll just introduce today's topic. Today, we are talking about disclosures. This is one of those issues where, you know, on the surface, it might seem like a very niche issue, but really it's one of those topics that just every advertising lawyer needs to know about, no matter what sort of product or what sort of service, um, what industry you or your client are in, you know, if they're doing advertising, they probably need to know about disclosures. Sure, absolutely. And, and, you know, what is a disclosure? Like, what are we actually talking about? Because, you know, this term means all sorts of things, but in advertising, a disclosure means sort of any information that you're conveying to consumers that seeks to clarify or limit the message conveyed by your advertising claim. Right. And and that definition, that's the easy part. Uh how do you make your disclosure, how do you make sure your disclosure is effective? Now, that's the hard part. Um, how, what do we at NAD mean when we say an effective disclosure? So at NAD, we often use two phrases to describe what makes a sufficient disclosure, like what the standard is. The first phrase, clear and conspicuous. And the second phrase, easy to notice, read, and understand. And the FTC doesn't always use the same language, but they basically apply that same standard. Right. And um, for some recent examples, uh, we can look to the FTC and a round of warning letters that they sent out in 2014. Um, At that time, they sent, it was just a bunch of warning letters to more than 60 companies as part of a program they named Operation Full Disclosure. So these letters were about the adequacy of the disclosures used in advertising. At the same time, they also published a really great blog post that was written by Leslie Fair. It's still on their website. You can go and check it out. Um, that laid out a, a pretty simple guide that advertisers could use to check for the sufficiency of their disclosures. And it used the mnemonic, the four Ps. And so let's just run through quickly what they each stand for. Sure. Okay. So the four Ps prominence that basically i think most commonly refers to like the font size right like in a visual disclosure can you see it is it tiny font is it hard to see the second presentation and this often relates to how easy it is to understand a disclosure right is it in jargon is it confusing wording is it in a block of long text that a consumer is not likely to read how is it the the information being presented to consumers Placement. Where is it in your ad? You know, consumers' eyes sort of move to certain places when they're looking at an advertisement. And if it's in a place where consumers aren't looking, they're not going to see it. And lastly, proximity. How close is the disclosure to the claim itself? If a consumer is seeing the claim, are they going to also see the disclosure and know that that claim is uh, being limited or clarified in some way, you know, because the claim, the the disclosure is kind of far away from from that triggering claim. 
So whether looking at advertising through this, you know, four P's lens or, you know, with the easy to notice, read and understand lens at NAD, we often see disclosures that fall short of these basic principles. You know, we see uh, disclosures that are in mice type fonts or that use odd language that, you know, doesn't really make sense. You have to read it a couple times to even, you know, kind of get what, what the disclosure is saying. Disclosures that are, are basically hidden where the eye doesn't go, or you have to, you know, kind of scroll and scroll and search around to, you know, find the disclosure. You know, these are all issues that come up over and over again in our cases. Um, Hal, do you want to talk about, you know, an example that comes to mind? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, as you sort of said, we see this stuff a lot. There's one case from a while back that is the one I think of first. There was a product with a complicated technical claim on the front of a big, heavy bag. Right, like the the pack that the product was like came to consumers in a big heavy bag. I think it was like a forty pound bag, right? And this complicated quantified performance claim was on the front with a small asterisk, and the disclaimer was on the back at the bottom. So when you have think of it as a bag, right, kind of like folds a little. It's like kind of like on the underside of the of the product itself because the bag sort of folds and curves underneath. So you could barely see the disclosure, you would have to lift up a 40 pound bag and kind of turn it around and look at the underside of it in order to find the disclosure. And then when you got there, it kind of didn't clearly talk about the limitations of the claim. It, it used confusing technical language about the test that the claims were based on. And it's not clear that a consumer would have even understood it. So, you know, what is not clear and conspicuous, not easy to notice, read and understand, not prominent in proximity to the claim and all the other P's, having to you know engage in weightlifting and mental gymnastics in order to understand your claim, your your disclosure. Like if that's what you're doing, you're you're not doing it right. Um, and, and we obviously recommended that 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 disclosure be be changed. So you know those examples, I think, fit really clearly into like that four P's type analysis. Um, but you know, there's that, that's sort of like, that's like the 100 level course of how to, like, if you're doing that, you're, you're kind of hitting the basics, I think, but it does get more nuanced, right? There, there's still a few places where an advertiser can go wrong and, and, and would need to think a little more deeply about their disclosure, what it says and how they're using it. Uh, I think of it's almost like, you know, there's like, there's the theory in, in math class, and then there's like the corollary that you learn in like your second math, math class when you get a little older, the, 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 the side rule that sort of builds off the initial rule. So, so I think there's a little bit of that going on here too. Right. So today we thought we would maybe identify some additional issues and, and things for advertisers to think about and try to avoid when trying to make effective use of disclosures. And, you know, we just talked about the FTC's four P's. We're going to talk about our five P's or the five pitfalls to avoid when using disclosures. How, why don't you kick us off? I get it. I get it. The P stands for pitfalls. I like it. All right. So, so let me, let me sort of hit on the first one then. I think something that, that's commonly an issue is that a disclosure in the context of an advertising claim is not meant to be a disclaimer, right? Disclaimers and disclosures are different. Disclosures disclose useful information to consumers. Disclaimers, on the other hand, are disclaiming the claim, right? It's it's meant there. Uh, it's meant to do something uh, different and, and to modify the the original language in, in a different way, right? Like I am not liable. I am not uh, responsible for something, right? Like it's different. It's a different kind of disclosure. It's a specific type of disclosure. And when we're talking about claim substantiation, we are not looking at disclaimers, we're looking at disclosures, right? So everybody sees these fine print ads, whether it's on TV, uh, these fine print sort of disclosures or disclaimers on TV or print, 
with like a block of text at the bottom. No one can read it. No one does read it. And it's sort of like this fast talking, hard to understand information that's presented as part of an advertisement. That's not the kind of disclosures that deal with claim substantiation, right? We're looking for something different. And that doesn't mean to say that that language isn't important and isn't there for, for a real reason, right? There's legal requirements that you say something or, or there's information that isn't necessary for the consumer to get a truthful message that an advertiser might want to put in their ad. Don't try this at home, right? Or like a mortgage licensing number on an ad for, for a mortgage company, right? Like that has to be in the ad, but there's legal standards for how that's presented. And a consumer doesn't necessarily need the mortgage licensing number or the don't try this at home message in order to understand the claim truthfully. So, so it's something different. When you're talking about a disclosure that modifies an advertising claim, the consumer actually needs to be able to digest it and understand it and see it and read it for that ad to be truthful. And so, you know, pitfall number one, don't treat your ad disclosures as disclaimers if that's not what they're doing. Exactly. I think you you really hit the nail on the head when when you pointed out that these are disclaimers that don't go to the truthfulness of the message that's that's being conveyed. And I think one place that it's really hard for advertisers sometimes to understand the differences in television media because on TV, like you said, you know, for things that involve financing or, or big purchases or, or particularly dangerous, I'm thinking of, you know, mortgages, car uh, advertising, you know, certain things, there are all these tiny fonts that, you know, nobody reads, nobody even knows kind of why they're there. But because they aren't disclosures, they don't have to follow the same rules. The standards for those disclaimers and how they're presented on TV um, are generally, you know, set by the networks or or other bodies. And, you know, we're not going to say that we love them because we think that, you know, everybody should be able to read and understand all of the information uh, presented to them, no matter, you know, why it's being presented to them, but they're not really our concern. And I think sometimes there's just a confusion where companies want to present a disclosure in the same way that they would present a disclaimer and, that's just not the case. There is just, you know, there are different standards. And even though you might get away with saying, don't try this at home in a small font in a television ad, um, a disclosure that goes to uh, the truthfulness of, of the message being conveyed in your advertising, you know, might not be able to get away with being presented in the same manner. So the second pitfall, I think, is don't contradict your main claim in your disclosure. You know, that's kind of the basic rule. A proper disclosure doesn't contradict the express claim being made in your main claim. And we've seen so many of it, so many iterations of this over the years in NAD cases. And, and sometimes it's blatant. It's a claim that's like, you know, free cookie with purchase. And then there's an asterisk and a, a disclosure that says cookies actually cost, you know, $6.99. That's a, you know, it's a contradiction. It's, it's very clear, um, but that's, it's hardly ever that blatant. You know, it's more common for the contradiction to be subtle and, one example from a case um, that we handled a few years ago was a claim for a pepper spray product. And the claim was that the advertiser's pepper spray can go the furthest and shoots 16 feet. It was a claim that was made on the front of the package. And the advertiser argued that this express claim on the front of the package was qualified by a disclosure on the back of the package that said this product generally has a range of up to 10 to 16 feet, but can be altered by wind and other conditions. 
So that's an example of, you know, that disclosure wasn't really limiting the express message. It was contradicting it. A disclosure that, you know, the express claim says 16 feet and the disclosure is like, oh, well, 10 to 16 feet, but maybe only in certain conditions and when the wind is blowing and it's a nice, bright, sunny day and yada, yada, yada. You know, that's that's contradicting the main claim. 16 does not equal 10 to 16. Exactly. The main claim says that the product reaches 16 feet. You can't take that back in the disclosure and you can't contradict it. And in that situation, it doesn't matter if it's clear and conspicuous. It doesn't matter about the size of your disclosure. You know, you, you're you sending a false message, right, in your main claim and or, or an unsubstantiated message uh, in, in the context of a substantiation issue, right? So, so it, you don't even get to the four Ps in that situation, right? Like you, you're, you're, you're headed off at the pass by that contradiction. Exactly. I mean, you, you, you have to hit all four Ps, <laughs> you know, you can't, it doesn't matter if you got three out of four, you know, if, if the fourth one is, you know, sort of, you know, key to consumer understanding and you fail there, um, you fail overall. Totally. So, um, pitfall number three, uh, putting too much in the fine print and, this is maybe this is a little more similar to sort of the straight four P's analysis, but like a, a, a little more detail on it. But you know, products or services that have lots of material information uh, that are required and sort of qualifications, oftentimes, you know, you make the big splashy claim in the main claim, and then there's all these even if they're not direct contradictions, just sort of limitations, and you put that all into the fine print, at some point, it's not understandable. Consumers aren't going to get all that information, and, and it renders the claim deceptive, right? So oftentimes, in order for a consumer to really understand what's going on uh, with an advertising claim, you have to work some of that material information into the claim itself, right? If you have a block of text limiting and qualifying a simple claim, consumers are still going to take away the simple message because they're not going to get through that dense information that's sort of presented below in a disclosure. And sometimes, you know, it's not, it's not really contradicting, but it sort of fundamentally alters the benefit of the claim. So we uh, had a case with like an online retailer and they were offering a discount in a big splashy claim. And the limiting information was that that discount was as part of a subscription service uh, that you would you would purchase, right? It's not actually contradictory. Like there is a benefit, but in sort of a there's such a fundamental change in the message that's being conveyed and the benefit that's being offered that by sort of hiding that material term in a disclosure you're not necessarily conveying a proper message, a fully supported message in that main claim. Yeah, I think this pitfall in particular highlights the importance of not doing your claim development in a vacuum. You know, your marketing and your product development and your legal all need to work together because basically if the claim you develop doesn't actually line up with the product or the service or the benefit you offer, you know, using, it's going to be really, really difficult to use a disclosure to sort of fix the claim. You know, it's, it's that you really kind of need to start with an understanding of what you're trying to convey and what you can properly convey that's supported and then work from there. For sure. So pitfall number four, I, I think, is, is a really interesting one. And, and it kind of goes to, to the, the actual construction of the visual, right? We were just talking about the construction of the claim and the way that marketing and legal and the product teams should work together to ensure that they're properly conveying the benefit. But they also need to work together to make sure that they're properly conveying the message that is supported, right? 
And one of those things that is often skipped is not considering the medium in which you are advertising, right? So, you know, speaking of font size and, and prominence and, and things like that, you know, a font size that's okay for a print ad that is sort of text heavy and consumers are going to spend time reading is not necessarily okay for a TV ad where it's going to be up there for five, seven seconds against the moving background, right? Are consumers actually going to read it? Maybe in one medium they will, in another medium they won't. And saying that disclosure is okay in a vacuum doesn't do all that much. It has to be okay in the context of the medium and the advertising that, that, that consumers are getting, right? So like I've had a case on a, a website, right? There's a disclosure and it's fine. But then uh, once that disclosure moves to a website and you scroll over the menu that appears above the disclosure, the drop down menu obscures the disclosure. So then you're getting the claim without the disclosure, right? Like that is a problem of medium, right? Not considering the medium in which your disclosure is presented. So it's very easy to sort of just say X font size is fine, put it near the claim and, and just give blanket guidance. But you really need to think about each presentation in which the claim is being made and how it might be different based on the medium. Because Consumers are going to view it differently. They view TV differently than print, differently than the web, and, and, and even differently than mobile, right? So each presentation kind of needs its own individual treatment when you're thinking about the, the sufficiency of disclosures. Right. I, I also recently had a case where um, there was a particular image that was being used with a disclosure. And when it was used in a TV ad, the disclosure, you know, was perfectly readable um, and, it, and it worked. But then the advertiser used the same image in their Amazon page. Um, and it was completely shrunken down to, you know, just a, a few inches. And then, you know, the disclosure is no longer readable. And then they used it in a social media ad where, you know, again, it's kind of in size wise, kind of in the middle between, you know, if you're looking at it on your computer, maybe it's readable, but if you're looking at it on your phone, maybe it's not readable. And so, you know, even though it perfectly illustrates that, you know, even though it was the same ad with the same disclosure and it was okay in one medium, you know, when you start changing the medium, then maybe the disclosure doesn't work anymore. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So our final pitfall, pitfall number five, is kind of closely related to number four. And it's it's not considering the platform, which is a little bit different. At this point, most people are on social media in, in one way or another, unless you're Hal, and then you're not on social media. But <laughs> most people, I think it's like seven out of 10 people um, use some form of social media. And so you know, there are always new ones coming and going, and it's important to consider the social media platform when developing your disclosure. It's important to look at your disclosures, one, even inside the medium, because something that might work, for example, for a static Instagram ad might not work for an Instagram story. Again, kind of depends on how people, you know, will people have enough time to read a disclosure, you know, that's going, you know, flying by in an Instagram story. But I think the, the bigger thing is to consider posting across platforms, because again, with all the different types of social media um, that are out there, advertisers do want to cater to different audiences, the TikTokers, you know, apparently the, the, the old people on <laughs> Facebook, you know, the, the, the young, you know, I don't even know what generation we're up to, but they're on something that I probably haven't even heard of yet. Um, but you have to consider how your disclosures will uh, transfer across all these different platforms. We recently had a case where an ad with certain disclosures um, that related to uh, the material connection of the influencers who are doing the posting were uh, made in one social media platform on TikTok. 
but when the videos were shared to other platforms, sometimes the disclosure did follow. You know, and and the the reason and the the facts behind why the disclosures didn't follow were were a technical issue. It it really it depended on how the video was initially posted and how the disclosures were embedded, and you know whether it was being shared from TikTok to Instagram versus from Instagram to TikTok. And the case really, you know, this was just a little bit of. Um, the advertiser being uninformed about how the platform worked, you know, it just didn't realize that, you know, most other platforms, when you post an ad and it has disclosures in it, it, it they automatically follow. And it just wasn't the case on TikTok. So it was an easy fix. Um, the advertiser just started requiring its influencers to embed their disclosures in their videos in a particular way so that the disclosures would transfer along with the video, no matter what platform it was shared to. But it really kind of illustrated an important lesson about, you know, with all these new ways um, of sharing content over different social media platform, platforms, you, you can't take anything for granted. You really have to make sure that everything is operating the way you would want it to and that your disclosures are, are making it to the final product. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, you, no one can, you know, reach out to me on social media to, to ask me questions about, about this one. But uh, Latoya, you're on social media, so they can, they can find you and at you and, and uh, whatever, whatever it is that, uh, you know, if, if if anyone had any problems with what Latoya just said, you just you just go reach out to her on her on her social media. Right, I'm easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> so Latoya, um, you know, we like to we got we got our five pitfalls in. Any last sort of tips and takeaways for our listeners about how to craft and present disclosures uh, in advertising? Sure. You know, with all of these, you know, different things to remember, the four P's, the five P's, you know, it can kind of start to sound like there's just, you know, innumerable risks and hazards that you have to navigate. Um, I think Hal would liken it to the Atari game Pitfall. I myself would probably, you know, analogize to um, a particularly challenging level of Super Mario Brothers. But um, this is actually, it's really manageable. You can beat the game. Um, you just have to keep a, a few things in mind. One thing um, I think advertisers should keep in mind is that if you start from a place of, of trying to communicate a clear, um, well-supported message in your main claim, it'll be a lot easier to utilize disclosures in a clear and conspicuous way. Like we said at, at the beginning of the episode, a disclosure is intended to limit or clarify a claim. So the better your claim, the clearer your claim, the less heavy lifting your disclosure will need to do. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that claim substantiation, you know, the having to defend your claim and your claim um, and the message that it conveys it goes much more smoothly when your claim development process takes your product testing or, or whatever evidence you intend to rely upon into consideration at the onset. So the bottom line is, you know, if you start with a confusing or a poorly worded claim, it's going to be really hard to bridge the gap um, of consumer understanding by slapping on a disclosure. So don't start, you know, in the hole. <laughs> you want to try to make your claim as, as clear as possible and, you know, to make sure it's well supported and matches with the benefit that you want to offer the consumer. And then you will have a much easier time figuring out, you know, if you need a disclosure and if you do, how to present it in a way that is effective and, and aids consumer understanding. You have anything to add, Hal? Yeah. I mean, I think just something we sort of referenced a little bit in the last episode when we were talking about the Pfizer factors and, and considering your, your evidence and 
you know, look at this, all, all the four P's, clear and conspicuous, easy to notice, read and understand. It's all about seeing the eye, the advertisement through the eyes of the consumer, right? What is a consumer going to take away? And are they going to notice and read and understand this disclosure? Are they going to understand the claim in the context of that disclosure? And in addition to sort of taking these tools to, to sort of check and make sure that you're doing it right, also think about the disclosure in the context of how a consumer is going to see it, you know, step into the shoes the same way we do and serve as a check on your own advertising that way. I, I think that that's never a bad idea to understand what you're communicating and, and to sort of try and try and understand your claims in that lens um, and, and your disclosures in that lens. And I think any advertiser would be better off um, doing that. Makes sense to me. Thank you again for tuning in to this episode of the Ad Watchers. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into disclosures. So join us next month when we'll be discussing express versus implied claims and reasonable messages. We already spoke last episode about reasonableness as far as it applies to evidence. But next month in the next episode, we'll be talking about reasonableness as it applies to the messages conveyed by your ad. As always, you could head over to our website, bbbprograms.org, to learn more about what we do at the National Advertising Division or any of BBB National Program's other self-regulatory programs. That's all for this episode. See you next time. Bye, LaToya. Bye, Hal. Bye.